And now, the downside of this is what quantum mechanics giveth, quantum mechanics will also taketh away. Quantum mechanics gives NMR a significant disadvantage compared to the other forms of spectroscopy as well. Now we've already encountered some of the issues with NMR. Uh, the number of magnetic nuclei, simple magnetic nuclei we might want to study is fairly limited. Even those we do have available, their natural abundance may be fairly low. C13 is the common example. But there is one other problem inherent in NMR that comes from the quantum mechanics that we can't do a whole lot about. Um, and it is a problem that the other forms of spectroscopy don't have. So let's take a look at that one now. Remember fundamentally, this is the most basic idea of what NMR is. You have a big out, uh, big honking magnetic field, a magnetic nucleus in the low energy spin state. Available to it is a higher energy spin state separated by a certain amount of energy, which means a certain frequency of light can be used to manipulate that. In NMR itself, it's related to two things, the magnetogyric ratio, the strength of the uh, the, the characteristic of the nucleus that we were trying to study, the big honk and magnetic field, and then a couple of other components in here as well, Planck's constant and even pi in there just because it's kind of cool to have it. Now, that tells us fundamentally the energy of the transitions that uh, occur when we do NMR spectroscopy. And if I take that, we've seen this calculation before, but I'm going to go ahead and repeat it here. If we take that calculation and plug in the various numbers and see what comes out, um, 267 point, and there it is, 512 radians per tesla second, the magnetogyric ratio of proton, R, big honk and magnetic field, a 9.39 tesla magnet. 6.626 times 10 to the negative 34 joules seconds for Planck's constant all over 2 pi, which is essentially saying, uh, you know, 2 pi, 1 radian. The radians therefore cancel, Teslas cancel, the seconds cancel, leaving me only joules, which is kind of convenient here, and I get 2.65 times 10 to the negative 25th joules, which is an extraordinarily small number. And if I take that number and multiply by Avogadro's number and then convert to kilojoules per mole, which is a more common chemistry unit, that is 1.54 times 10 to the negative fourth kilojoules per mole. Remember, the energy it needs you need to break a chemical bond is on the order of a couple of hundred, three to four hundred joules. This is far, far, far weaker than that. NMR doesn't come anywhere close to breaking any chemical bonds. It's a very low energy form of spectroscopy. Now, critical to all of this consideration is something called a Boltzmann distribution. And it basically says the following. If you have two, uh, two states available here, magnetic orientation, but positions of an electron in energy levels or vibration frequencies any, for any form of spectroscopy, then the available energy in the surroundings, remember we're working here at room temperature, we're not talking about down there at absolute zero, will tell you how much energy is just available to put nuclei or to put molecules in, in the higher energy spin state relative to the low energy spin state. And the concept is basically what is the population of the high energy spin state versus what is the population of the low energy spin state. Now I'm not going to derive this equation. I just, you know, steal it from our neighborhood physical chemist and run off and make use of it. I'm not smart enough to be able to derive these things. But the appearance of it is simply the exponential of the energy difference divided by kappa, Boltzmann's constant, times temperature. Now what I'm going to do is I'm just simply going to plug that energy in and uh, also use Boltzmann's constant. 
And that is essentially the exponential of negative 2.65 times 10 to the negative 25th joules. Boltzmann's constant, 1.38 times 10 to the negative 23rd. And the units on that thing, joules per Kelvin times 298 Kelvin. Just a rough calculation using room temperature. The, the, all the units over here are going to cancel. And when I take the exponential of that, I'm going to come out with this value. It's not, it's not going to mean much at the moment, but we're going to put some meaning on it in a second. It's going to come out almost 1, 0.99994. Now, in a sense, these are population values. What fraction of your molecules are in the high state versus what fraction are in the low state here? Technically, the number in the, the fraction that are in the high energy state and the fraction that are in the low energy state do have to add up to one. And therefore, I'm going to take this and modify it a little bit because I can take that and say the fraction in the high energy state is one minus the fraction in the low energy state. And if I take that and plug it in here, I can write it that way. And now applying a little magic algebra to it, I solve for PL, and I get this value, 0 0.50002. Now, so what? Here's what it means. If I convert that to a percentage, it means that the number of nuclei in, or the percentage of nuclei in the low energy spin state here is 50.002%. Therefore, 49.998% of them are in that high energy spin state. I want you to think about those for a moment. I'm going to rewrite that here. 50.002% there and 49.998% there. In other words, in NMR spectroscopy, when I take my sample and put it in the big honking magnetic field, We've said, ooh, the nuclei line up, uh, you, know, you know, North Pole to South Pole with a big honk and magnetic field. But realize that is such a small energy difference. We are at room temperature. There is so much energy just surrounding all this stuff, thermal energy from the surroundings, that in reality, almost half of our nuclei have enough energy to sit at any one instant in time in the high energy spin state they are almost evenly divided between the two. Here's the problem with quantum mechanics. Quantum mechanics tells us that the best I can do when I move nuclei between my various spin states, or in any form of spectroscopy, move molecules from the low energy to the high energy spin states, the best I can do is invert their spin state populations. In other words, the best I can ever do here is to simply reverse these two, uh, these two percentages to get 50.002% of my molecules in the high energy spin state and 49.998% of them in the low energy spin state. Now think about what that means. If I have 100,000 nuclei in my sample tube that I've just put in the magnet, that means almost ha a, just a slightly greater than half of them, 50,000 and two of them, will be in the low energy state. And 49,998 of them will be in the high energy state. Then I come along with my photon and I cause those populations to switch. Now, 49,998 of them will be here, 50,000 and two of them will be there. Do you realize what that is? Four nuclei. 
four of them have actually made the transition. That's all it takes to do this. Out of every 100,000 nuclei I put in here, I am going to at maximum be able to see four of them undergo a transition at any one time. That means that I am going to not be able to detect anything from the vast majority of my molecules in that tube. This is why NMR, for all of its wonderful aspects, is such a low sensitivity technique. This is why we need high, relatively high concentrations in our sample tubes. The UV Viz folks can get away with very low, part per billion, part per trillion concentrations sometimes. We can't do that. We have to have a lot of molecules in there, far more than 100,000, to be able, you know, millions and billions of them, to be able to see significant signals. And it's because of the Boltzmann distribution and the fact quantum mechanics says the best you can ever hope for is to invert your spin state populations. This is putting numbers to it, and it shows us the number of nuclei that undergo this transition is very small. I'm going to buy the magic eraser, and I want to do one other diagram that tries to really uh, flesh out uh, the consequences of this business when comparing NMR spectroscopy to some of the others. All right, what I'm going to do is I'm going to take an extremely simplistic look. It's not going to re accurately use those numbers, uh, uh, those nearly 50-50 uh, population uh, difference in the low and high energy spin state. But I'm only going to use 12 because it's easier to draw. But the consequences uh, are still there. We have big honking magnetic field, the two spin states available. I'm going to use, let's say, a total of 12 nuclei. Now, all 12 nuclei, if the world were perfect, they'd all be down here in the low energy spin state. But now we know that there's only a tiny excess, a tiny excess down here. Now, to make that easier to draw, I'm going to do it this way. I'm going to have one, two, three, four, five, six, seven out of the 12 here, and therefore five out of the 12 there. A slight excess of the total in the low energy state versus the high energy state. Now, quantum mechanics says the best I can do is move, is have seven in the high energy, five in the low energy. Invert my spin state populations. That means that it's a difference of only two of these. I take two of these and move them up there. And that's all I'm going to be able to see. Out of the 12 that I had here, only two of them are going to actually absorb photons, are actually going to change their spin states. So I'm not going to see 12 molecules. I'm only going to be able to see two. Now, in reality, I need to have millions of them and have very small numbers moving, but that's hard to draw, so I'll use 12. Now, compare that with ultraviolet. It's a much higher energy form of spectroscopy. That means the difference in energy in ultraviolet is much larger than in NMR. Now, I have it a little bit larger here. In reality, we're talking orders of magnitude larger. It's hard to put all these on scale. Uh, so just remember, this is you know really huge. Boltzmann then says the difference in the populations here is going to be 99% of them here, 1% of them there. Using 12 things again, I'm going to put 1, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, and the 12th one up there. In reality, it's 99.99% you know, and 0.001%. Now, you'll notice in the UV viz, I don't have my external magnetic field. I didn't use arrows to indicate the molecules and the various uh, energy states. Um, they're not magnetic. They're not, we're not concerned about how they orient in an external magnetic field, another difference between this technique and NMR. Quantum mechanics says the best I'm going to be able to do is invert these populations, and therefore, after 
the ultraviolet photon comes by, what I will see is 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11. Do you realize that means 11 photons, or 11, excuse me, 11 uh, transitions have just occurred. Out of the 12 that I had to look at, I saw 11 of them transition. That's almost all of them that is inherently going to give me more to look at a stronger signal than NMR would. Now again, let me emphasize, I'm using the number 12 because it's easy to draw. In reality, if I was using you know, 12 billion, I would see only a few molecules in NMR move, and I would see nearly all 12 billion of them move in UV. So the difference in sensitivity between the two is far greater than what I've diagrammed here, but it tries to get across the basics of the idea. This is the peril of NMR spectroscopy, the price uh, quantum mechanics extracts from us to give us all of that high resolution business. We are such a low energy technique in NMR that our two pop, our spin state populations are virtually equally populated and therefore the number of, I, number of uh, nuclei undergoing transitions is very small. There are a couple of things we can try to do to correct that or, or to, to improve that. Can't correct it, it's inherent in the quantum mechanics. But to improve it, use a bigger magnetic field. Um, bigger B naught changes that fraction slightly. On our old instrument at 250 megahertz, instead of 50.002%, it was 50.001%. On older, less powerful magnets, Inherently, the quantum mechanics says your signals are going to be even weaker. This is one reason why having stronger magnetic fields is of such an advantage when you're doing NMR. But let's face it, unless you can get magnetic fields that are, you know, are orders of magnitude stronger than available today, uh, you're not going to overcome this situation to any great extent. And so, as I've said, quantum mechanics giveth. Quantum mechanics taketh away. This is an inherent problem in NMR spectroscopy. It is not a sensitive technique. We can only detect a very small fraction of our, of our nuclei undergoing their spin state transitions. With a smaller magnetogyric ratio for C13, the problem is even more dire there. Carbon is less sensitive than protons. So this is a real problem. This is one of the great disadvantages of NMR and why we need such high concentrations relative to the other forms of spectroscopy.